Hello, hello, my ladies. I've always loved that way of addressing a woman. My lady, my lady. I think everyone should address us that way, don't you? It just sounds so regal. You already know that I'm menopause Taylor, the lady, your lady, <laughs> who teaches you everything you need to know about menopause. And for the last 43 videos, I've taught you all about Alzheimer's and how to prevent it. This is the 44th and the second to last video on Alzheimer's. We've nearly made it to the end of the unit. So this is video number 279, and it's on something called epigenetics. I mentioned epigenetics briefly during video 248 on the genetics of Alzheimer's disease itself, but there's more to the genetics of Alzheimer's than I was able to tell you about in that video. And it wasn't that I was withholding information or anything like that. It's just that you didn't have enough of an education on Alzheimer's then to make use of what I'll be telling you today. Like I've said on so many occasions, <laughs> if you want any chance at all at managing your menopause successfully, you absolutely must watch these videos in order. I am absolutely pedantic about the order in which I deliver the information so as to give you the education you deserve. So this video is ultra important even if, actually, especially if you have a genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's. And if you have a family history of Alzheimer's, you might have a genetic predisposition of which you are unaware. So if so, this video is a must. I am going to make you very happy today. <laughs> now, in my book, all of chapter 33 is on Alzheimer's, but this particular stuff is much better in this video. <laughs> Back in video number 245, on how to know if you're at risk for Alzheimer's disease, I presented all the risk factors for Alzheimer's, and I separated them into two groups, non-modifiable and modifiable. And I made a big chart of all the risk factors that you've seen multiple times. Well, here it is again. If you look at the second item in the non-modifiable risk factors, you see genetics in a light blue row. Then, in video 248 on the genetics of Alzheimer's, I taught you about all the different genetic mutations that exist for Alzheimer's you learn that there are certain mutations for early onset Alzheimer's and others for late onset Alzheimer's. And you learn that there are varying degrees of the likelihood that any given mutation will actually result in the disease. In that video, I created another chart showing you the different ramifications for the different types of genetic mutations for Alzheimer's. Here it is again. In the first column, you see a list of all the factors that this chart addresses for the various genetic mutations. The name of the mutation, whether Alzheimer's is guaranteed by that mutation, the age of onset of Alzheimer's with that mutation, the effect of the mutation on your risk of Alzheimer's, the probability that you will actually get Alzheimer's if you have that mutation, and the effect on the average risk of Alzheimer's. In the red color, you see the three forms of early onset Alzheimer's. They are all guarantees that you will get the disease earlier than age 65 with a 100% probability. So they increase your risk above the average of the one in six greatly. The remainder of the chart addresses the different types of late onset Alzheimer's. They are arranged in decreasing order of severity, but none of the late onset Alzheimer's is a guarantee that you'll get the disease. And they range from increasing your risk by 10 times to actually decreasing your risk below the average of one in six. So the critical thing now is to focus on the fact that there are such wide variations of the effects of different gene mutations on your risk for Alzheimer's. But now I'm here to tell you that there is so much more to it 
than what you can decipher by genetics alone. And that's this thing we call epigenetics, which is the topic of this video. You can think of epigenetics as a system that turns your genes on or off. Because although your genes intend to dictate your destiny, they are not powerful enough to do so. Epigenetics is the science of how your genes interact with your environment and lifestyle habits. So if you thought that your genes are an absolute edict and that there's nothing you can do to affect them, you are very wrong. In video number 248, I use the analogy of a map and I explained to you that your genes are but a plan or a map. But there isn't just one destination on this map. There are many. And your genes only take you to one of these destinations. Epigenetics can lead you to a variety of destinations. So notice the map is marked with a predisposed genetic destination is in red here. But look, you see the green? The green enables you to go someplace other than where your genes would have led you. There's an entirely different destination designated in the green. So, depending on which path you choose to follow, you can end up where the red line takes you, or you can end up where the green line takes you. And that's precisely what epigenetics is all about. Epigenetics is your ability to choose diet, lifestyle, hormonal, and non-hormonal options for menopause management or for health management that have the ability to actually limit the power of your genes. The principle of epigenetics says that despite the fact that your genes are a roadmap to a specific outcome or disease, you have the power to change that outcome. In other words, you do not have to follow the red line on this map. If you take a different path, you can completely change where you go. And in the case of genetic mutations for a disease, you can completely change the outcome designated by your genes. So while you cannot change the fact that early onset Alzheimer's gene mutations will eventually cause Alzheimer's, you can change how early in your life they do so. And even though you may have the APOE4 genetic mutation for late Alzheimer's, you can do all sorts of things to decrease the likelihood of ever actually getting Alzheimer's. It's all up to you. So as I've said before, what happens to you is up to you. At the beginning of this video, I made reference to addressing women as my lady because it sounds and feels so regal. Well, another way of thinking about epigenetics is to think of your actual genes as king, but your power to override them as queen. You know, men always think that they are the ones in power, but, and yeah, a king may be the actual ruler, but believe you me, if a king has a queen, he does not have total control over hardly anything. In the case of epigenetics, you are the queen. You control whether or not your genetic kings ever have the opportunity to surge ahead without your consent or support. So how do you exert this influence over your genes? With your diet and lifestyle choices, that's how. It's as if your diet and lifestyle teach your genes how to behave. And as much as you may think of your genes as being immutable, the fact is that your entire genetic system is designed for change. This is precisely how all animals adapt to new situations. Think about bacteria. When you get infected with a bacterial microorganism, you get sick, right? Antibiotics will kill bacteria. But have you ever heard
heard anyone caution you about taking an antibiotic unnecessarily because it can result in resistance to the antibiotics? Do you realize that the entire situation is one of epigenetics for the bacteria? In other words, upon exposure to the antibiotic, the bacteria begin to transform their DNA such that with time, they are not affected by it. Of course, the life cycle of a bacterium is only a few days, which means that they can become resistant very quickly. Each generation will have stronger resistance to that particular antibiotic. Well, epigenetics works on both a generational level and an individual level. Your current genes are partially a product of the diets and lifestyles of your ancestors. But they are also a product of how you choose to live your own life. If you choose a healthy lifestyle, you will enhance your normal genes or even improve them further. And if you choose an unhealthy lifestyle, you will enhance your abnormal genes or even make them more abnormal. So you need to think of yourself as the middleman or middle woman between your genes and your destiny. Your genes may be king, but you are the queen. And you have the power to turn your junky genes into treasure. <laughs> in, the many, in the many videos that I've presented on management options for preventing Alzheimer's, you have discovered a variety of things that can actually prevent it and others that cannot. The key to epigenetics is to know the difference between those that can affect your genes and those that can't. So let me give you a list of the things that can and a list of the things that cannot. And as magical as all this sounds already, please, please, please do not try to make it more magical than it is by trying to force one of the inadequate options to perform an epigenetic role. Quite often I encounter women who try to make their own rules about such things. Please, please do not take a gamble like that. We're, this is your brain we're talking about. So here's a list of the management options that can truly change your genes in a way that decreases your genetic potential for Alzheimer's. In the lifestyle category, you can challenge your brain with new, different, and difficult tasks. Practice focusing on one thing at a time. Employ all measures for decreasing your risk of a heart attack. Do cardiovascular exercise daily. Do exercise that requires focus on the exercise itself. Avoid exercise ruts. Get outdoor exercise. Reduce your stress. Practice regular sleep routines. Engage in rewarding and pleasurable social interactions. Maintain sobriety. Adhere to your body's natural rhythms. Adhere to productive routines and avoid destructive ruts. In the diet category, you can eat frequently. Practice calorie restriction, but not intermittent fasting. Eat antioxidant and anti-inflammatory foods. Eat foods that contain the amino acid leucine. Eat fresh fruits and veggies that have fiber and enhance your microbiome. Eat foods containing omega-3 fats. Eat fresh food and avoid processed food. In the hormonal medication category, you can take estrogen replacement before or as soon as you stop producing your own at an adequate dosage that travels throughout your body and reaches your brain. And in the non-hormonal medication category, you can take NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. My ladies, that's a lot of options. You have so much queenly power here. Use it. And here's a list of the management options that cannot change your genes in a way that decreases your genetic potential for Alzheimer's. Vitamins, minerals, and supplements. 
herbal options, all non-hormonal medication options other than the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. With such a difference in the number of options that actually do suffice for purposes of preventing Alzheimer's, you can be very happy that the ones that do greatly outnumber the ones that don't. This should make you very happy. But again, as I've said in previous videos, what happens to you is up to you. Some of these things are not quick and easy. And I think that the very first step is to get over your desire for quick and easy. The reward for your hard work will save your brain. All right, guess what? There is only one more video in this Alzheimer's unit. Next week, I'll address the issue of overlapping management options and show you a nifty way to discover them. You know what to do next. Schedule consultations at menopausetaylor.me. Subscribe right here. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I will see you in a week. Bye, my ladies.